Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. This is your host, Amina Ahmed, and you're watching Muslim Network TV. Welcome back to another episode of Next Gen, a platform in which we hope to amplify the voices of young people, especially young people who are not given enough of a platform in today's mainstream media. We're there on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Muslim Network TV, Amazon Fire TV, Roku, and Apple TV soon as well, as well as all of our other social media and YouTube. Now, on today's episode, we're going to be speaking on an issue that is not addressed in many of our communities, but is an issue that causes many to suffer in silence. An issue that needs to be addressed but unfortunately is shoved under the rug. The issue of mental health. Across the nation and the globe, many young people, especially now, are suffering in silence. They suffer because they don't have anyone to talk to, they don't have a community that is supportive of them, and then they don't get help. 70% of children and young people who experience mental health problems have not had appropriate intervention at a young age. The fact is mental health is treatable. It's okay for people to get treatment, but because of the stigma around it in our own communities, so many suffer. One in five adults, even in the United States, have reportedly had a mental health or have a mental health issue. But out of that, only 40% go out to seek treatment. And that just goes to show how negatively that uh, the stigma around mental health can impact the lives of so many. 40% of people, that's almost half the people who have mental health issues who are not seeking help, who are choosing to suffer in silence because their communities refuse to support them. So the question arises, will we as young people remove the stigma of mental health for our children and the generations that come after us can speak to us about what they are going through? Or will we continue what our parents and grandparents and the generations that came above us did, suffer in silence? And to answer these questions, we have with us two young mental health advocates. Mental health is extremely something personal to them, and they've chosen to be vulnerable in order to bring light to these issues. First, we have Taba Daba. Taba is Hi. Hi, Taba. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, Taba is a sophomore at Lake Forest uh, College, for, and she's from South Africa. She's passionate about legal studies, civil service, and enjoys psychological research. In college, she's the Athletic Council Vice President of uh, Community Residence, and uh, she is extremely involved in her community, and she plays tennis as well. Thank you, uh, Taba. Thank you. That's a nice introduction. No, you're just so extremely involved in your community um, and in your college. You're, you know, a South African and, you know, you, you do a lot to represent uh, your community. You've given TED Talks on the topic of privilege and uh, you're just so involved. So my question to you is, how is it like, you know, in the middle of this pandemic, obviously you're not able to carry out so much of the work that you generally do. How have you been, you know, able to kind of cope? Um, you know, I think in this time when we are allowed to reflect and be alone a lot of the time, um, I really try to emphasize that now more than ever, knowledge is power. So the kind of books and the kind of podcasts or essays or papers that I didn't get to read during the school time when we're really busy or that we don't get to read um, in our schools, I've been trying to um, really get into that and uh, a research project that I'm doing with one of our professors as well. Yeah, so yeah. you're yourself uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Sorry, are you were muted? I'm muted. Yeah, so uh, you, I just said you're keeping yourself busy even in the middle of a pandemic, you've been able to, you know, manage. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think that was, that was a really important part of the the coping is to keep um, busy, keep, to keep reading into and doing things that I enjoy as much as possible. Although I can't play tennis anymore, 
uh, right now, but we'll get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you spoke about how you're coping um, right now in the middle of a pandemic, and I think it would be an appropriate time to bring out our next guest who writes passionately, uh, Icha Barlas. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Icha. Thank you for being with us today. It's an honor for us to have you. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, um, Isha is a 19-year-old student from London and is someone who suffered with depression and anxiety for many years of her life. She writes confidently and hopes to challenge societal attitudes towards mental health and raise awareness and remove the stigma. Uh, Isha, thank you so much for um, advocating, especially as someone who this is extremely personal to you. I want to ask you the same question that I asked Shabba. Have you been writing in the middle of this pandemic? How have you been able to, you know, continue to advocate? Yeah, um, I've never stopped writing, like from a young age. It's just something that I've always done. So even during the pandemic, it's just something that, because as someone who is more very vocal about how they feel, I feel like writing is a way of being able to cope with the thoughts and the emotions that you're feeling without having to necessarily express it to a person. Yeah, and you know, I wanted to kind of ask both of you, right? How is it like, um, not just now, but in general, living with uh, the mental health condition that many of you guys, that both of you guys live with uh, in terms of depression and anxiety? Just tell us, someone who's looking from the outside, help us empathize with you. How How is it like living with your condition? Um, so it's, it's something that, it's like a personal battle within yourself because it's like, it's, it's hard to explain to people who haven't experienced or gone through it how you're feeling or how it makes you feel and it's kind of like it's hard to fight the battles in your head that you go through every day and it's like feeling alone sometimes or that no one understands you even though you know that there are many people around the world that suffer from different mental health conditions but that feeling of still being alone and misunderstood is a constant throughout your life and it's not easy to be able to express yourself sometimes or do the things that you love to do because sometimes depression can make you lose that passion that you have for things that even that you enjoy and you just lose motivation and it's hard to just like live every day sometimes and it's kind of like yeah just it kind of stops you from doing what you do, like doing in your daily lives. Yeah, um, Isha, you spoke about how it's a daily struggle, you know, it, it's a battle between your own mind, between your own thoughts um, and yourself. And I think a lot of people, uh, the issue is they lack empathy because they can't relate. They just, you know, constantly just move themselves back. They uh, yeah. they find it hard to empathize with uh, a lot of, you know, people who have this condition. What about Tabe? Can you speak to us about how it's like, like living with mental health conditions? I think the biggest um, contribution, I mean, you're talking about the daily like struggle of anxiety and depression. I think the biggest contribution is the misconception of, of what it looks like is that, you know, if I'm really involved, like you were saying, if I'm really involved on campus um, and, you know, with people a lot of the time, then you don't expect or think that maybe I would be going through anxiety or depression. So, and I think, you know, that that's the kind of tug of war that you play is who are you going to be vulnerable with and who are you going to keep that um, sometimes, uh, you know, strong facade to, 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 to keep going. Um, yeah. So do you think it's like a lot of people with mental health issues, you wouldn't even know that they have that um, uh, issue or they're struggling within themselves? Um, I think so. I think if anything, I mean, if, if you know, some people aren't fortunate enough to also have people who they know they can truly open up to, um, I'm, I'm grateful that I do. Um, but I think uh, definitely that they want to not make anybody feel uncomfortable so they keep up with that kind of facade sometimes. Yeah, I'm yeah. interested. Yeah, as uh, someone who personally is always smiling and very, I'd say, bubbly and energetic around my friends, always laughing 24-7 at 
even the silliest things I just find so funny. So it's like, I feel like a lot of people are very shocked to know that, you know, that I'm, I'm suffering from depression or low mood because I've never shown it. It's always mm. been like a very private thing. So I think it is very hard to look at someone and be able to tell if they're going through anything or not. And I just want to say that it takes so much courage to do what you guys are doing, to advocate for something that you have to struggle with personally. So what I want to ask you is how, you know, how did you, you know, end up going out and starting to advocate for mental health when it's something that is a taboo in uh, the Asian community in regards to you, Isha, and also in the African community, in the South African community, particularly Teba. So where did you get that inspiration, that motivation to go out and speak about something that's so vulnerable to speak about? Okay, for me personally, um, for me, it was just getting to know a lot of other people who were going through the same thing as me. and realizing that you know it's not only me who had not come out and be like have anyone to talk about it openly so I, it kind of motivated me to be able to share what i've written in privately that i've never writ written anything for the intention of sharing it with anyone or the world but after coming into contact with so many people who are going through this alone and feeling like they are, they, that no one understands them. I wanted them to know that there are people out there that are going through exactly what they are and validate how they feel by saying that I understand you and I go, I'm going through the same thing as you. And that's kind of what led me to publish the poetry that I've written over the years that I've intended to keep just as a private way of just being able to cope with how I feel. But now it's something that other people can relate to and be like, yeah, you know, like, it's not just me. There's, like, many other people who can relate to it. And it kind of gives them hope for, like, and maybe some support and give them some kind of, you know, positive outlook that, you know, there's people out there that are there to support them no matter how they feel. Yeah, and uh, how about you, about what, you know, motivated you to go out and speak about what you're going through? Because obviously that does take a lot of time, especially if you come from a place where the mental health is a taboo. For me, uh, so my uh, depression and anxiety, I know it, it stems from how I was raised and kind of being raised to feel shame about my sexuality. And when I left high school, uh, when I graduated from high school, I moved to a totally new country and I lived in Spain alone for two years. So that was an opportunity to be in a totally new environment, to be a new person. And there where I no longer had to put up a, any kind of facade really, and I gave myself that time, um, I really found out and realized that there's no reason to be guilty or to be ashamed. And once I reconciled with that, I. I got the, the courage to, to stand up for what I believe in, stand up for my mental health and others. Um, yeah. So what was the response of your communities, you know? Uh, were they uh, supportive of you guys speaking out or what, was it something that they weren't supportive of? Supportive of? My, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> my, my, my parents, uh, those two individuals, they were very supportive. Um, they, if anything, they couldn't believe that they did not see what was happening. And you know, once I let them know, they were they were by my side and they wanted to understand more. Um, my extended family, however, um, because you know it is a belief that we have to be strong. You know, especially coming from the black uh, community as well, is we're always built on you need to be strong and you need to rise above and you need to make it, which is understandable. I mean, if you come from a culture and from a community that has been oppressed for so long, it's like there's no time to have mental health issues. There's no time to be depressed. There's no time to be anxious. Um, so they are not as supportive. My extended family, not, not so much. But uh, my parents and my siblings, they are learning with me. Um, we share articles and books all the time. So I'm really grateful for that. And with my extended family, we just have to keep having these kind of open conversations and you know, 
help them understand, see that yeah. you don't have to be so strong all the time. Yeah, and, and coming from the African community because there's so much stigma around it because there's you said there's no time for mental health, a uh, community that has faced oppression and persecution for so long. Uh, you guys are taught to be strong and vulnerability is not necessarily an option. And you spoke on the stigma as well. And I want to hit on um, the repercussions that come from just the stigmas around mental health in general. And we'll be right back after this short break. You're with us on Muslim Network TV, and you're watching us on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Muslim Network TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. It's Adam's World. Believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah. Let's explore. Welcome back to Network TV. We're here with Ishba Barlas and Teba. Uh, you know, we spoke on the stigma of mental health just a little bit, but I want to get deeply into uh, the stigma of mental health in the Asian community. Ishba, can you tell us about that? Is there a present um, stigma and nudging mind stigma on mental health in our community? Yeah, there definitely is. I feel like it's something that is brushed under the carpet very, very often. And it's something that um, a lot of, I feel like people in our community just don't have a lot of knowledge about or educated mm -hmm. about, which is why they kind of like, you know, make excuses for it. Or sometimes I've come across people within our communities that genuinely believe that mental health issues is a made up thing. You know, it doesn't exist. It's something that the Western world has just, come up with and it's, it's so shocking that you know it's, that it's a genuine belief that some people have you know and you know it's mostly some people think it's mostly adults or they're like the older generations that think that but I've come across people who are same similar age ranges as me or slightly older and they believe the same thing you know it's not something that I personally don't think it's something that only the older generation believes in and I feel like that makes it a lot harder for people to like, you know, share how they feel within the community because they feel like they should be ashamed or, you know, they can't talk about it. And um, as, especially as being in a Muslim community as well, it's kind of like there's a lot of Muslims that say that being depressed is because you are away from God or you are not practicing properly, you know, and it's kind of like, 
hard you know, for like you know that you don't want to live in the moment you know god has blessed you with this life and it's kind of like hard to explain how you can still be grateful you know to god and love god and religion but still feel like you don't want to have that life you know it's it's hard for people to get around that idea that you can be um religious but also depressed so i feel like it's not an asian thing in the asian community but it's also in the islamic community mm-hmm. and that that's what makes it hard for many individuals to be able to express yeah um you, you spoke about people thinking that you know because you're depressed or because you have suicidal thoughts or you're not religious that it's your relationship with um allah or with god that's broken but the fact is that you can be both right um that you can be depressed and also religious you can face mental health issues but also have a strong connection with god um, and a lot of people you know use religion to kind of uh cover up the fact that you know their child or someone in their community might be facing a mental health issue Teba, I want to get on the African community or the South African community in particular. How about there? Is there a hush hush mentality around mental health? I'm sorry, could you please repeat? Is there a. Yeah. yeah, is there a hush hush mentality? Like, is there a stigma around mental health? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, if, if, if you're not being complacent about it. So, even, even if you may believe that mental health it's an issue that mental health is a real thing. There's a lot of complacency about it because it can be a very uncomfortable topic to deal with. And people don't, we don't want to deal with that. that or they, there isn't time. They, they think that out of all the struggles you can have, this must be at the, at the bottom of the barrel, you know? Um, so there will be that complacency often. Um, that's definitely one of the stigmas. Um, and again, you know, I think especially when you're a, when you're a woman, um, there is so much that the woman has to do in, in the household in this you know South African in the Black South African culture. Um, you you have to be strong and educated, and you know you're raising your kids. Um, and it's and it's like if you allow yourself to fall into that. You know, trap of mental issues. Um, then it's it's like you're allowing yourself to be weak, or you you want to be lazy. You don't actually want to want to work. Or uh, another perspective that is also taken is that mental health is something for white people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and I you know I remember when my white friends would, would have you know mental issues and. You know, open up to me about it and I mean I'm ashamed to say this now but truly in the past that's what I believe and I'd be like you know that's not that's not really that's not really a real thing um you're just being spoiled or you, you know you're a small mm-hmm. rat or something like that um that's definitely one of the harmful uh, stigmas that are out there yeah um, uh, perceived as weakness, you said, and, and I think that's something that's very hurtful to people who want to go and, you know, get help, who want to get treated. So why do you think these stigmas are present in the first place, right? What causes these stigmas? Can you speak about that a little bit? Like, because I feel like in order to address the issue, we have to realize what is the cause of it, right? What's, where is this issue even coming from in the first place? Is it the negative attitudes that people in the older generation, or like Isha said, some people in the younger generation have? Or what else is it that's causing these stigmas? Isha? I think it's also the way that mental health is often portrayed as well. Mm-hmm. Like, especially like certain things with self-harm, it's like, considered as you know attention seeking some most times Mm -hmm. and especially in media it's like if you are showing your scars or trying to be open about mental health or saying that you're depressed it's kind of like people just assume you are seeking attention or pity from other people or just making excuses for example for bad grades or whatever it is i feel like people just aren't educated enough about it or the causes of mental health in general, which is why they just kind of assume things and that's kind of what leads to people to have negative um, attitudes and creates these stigmas in the first place. 
Yeah, so what's the media job in terms of portraying mental health in a positive light? What are some steps that mainstream media or even just social media in general, how can we uh, work to provide an environment that's safe for people who are uh, coping with mental health issues? What can we do? I think we can, first of all, educate people in general about how exactly mental health works and mm -hmm. show them that it's not a choice that many individuals, you know, choose to live with. Because another misconception about mental health is that people often choose to, um, you know, live this way and feel this way. But in reality, it's not something you can control. And we should be able to um, talk about mental health the way we talk about physical illnesses. And mm -hmm. I feel like the more we portray mental illness as something that is um, something that you can't control or or like is not something that you choose to have it makes it easier for people to talk about it and understand it and I feel like if you're the more educated you are about the causes of mental health and really anything related to it the more likely you are to um, not see it in a more negative light because often the negative um, portrayals are based on false misconce misconceptions mm -hmm. rather than actual facts. So, yeah. Yeah, Kevin, would you like to add to that? Um, I'm everything that Isha said, uh, I 100% agree with. And, you know, I'll also just like to point out that something that is also contributing to how, to all of these misconceptions and how people deal with with mental issues is is that we treat words like anxiety, depression, um, we treat them like like they're swear words. You know, <laughs> if if you if you can't even if you can't say it, we treat it like it's some kind of slur. At least in, in my culture, um, if you if you can't say it and you can't define it for what it is, then that's that's where the issues come in, how can we expect to dismantle those kind of, uh, you know, mentalities if we can't even speak about them, if we can't even truthfully speak about them, if we're always hiding behind, um, you know, trying to euphemize what anxiety and what depression is and where it comes from. So you're saying that just to the you know, surface level, we should be able to say those words without facing repercussions from our own people, our own community. So how has the stigma of mental health affected you personally, right? Um, in your family, and your friend group, how has that negatively um, impacted your viewpoint of what mental health is, or it has that stopped you from getting treatment ever? Talk to us a little bit about that. Um, personally, I, I thought that it was something that I was ashamed of and mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone to know like I feel like it was something that I had to keep away in the chest and not speak about as it would bring shame to my family or my parents or the community in general and it's not something as a Muslim that I should have to go through because I should have all the you know the peace of my religion and you know that the, my religion should be uh, a way of me to always think positively because with depression you, you often think negative in situations so it was definitely something that for years I thought I couldn't speak about or you know I never like went, reached out for therapy or anything like that until later on when I realized that you know despite what the community thinks or what I am told by Islamic people around me that I shouldn't be feeling like this. I realized mm -hmm. that if there was any chance for me to improve my own mental well-being, I had to make a step for myself. And you know, I started taking therapy in secret, but like nobody knew. And slowly, I realized that it was something that I didn't need to be ashamed of in the first place. And I became very open about it, and being able to talk about it through my poetry and publishing a book. That is something that I never thought I'd do because as someone who never even told my, one of my, any of my closest friends, it was like a really big step for me. But I feel like it had to be done in order to accept it for my, to myself before trying to make anyone else accept it. 
Um, wow, I, I, I want to applaud your courage for taking that step yourself because I know that can be so difficult. You didn't even have the support of your close friends, but you took that upon yourself to improve your own well-being, regardless of uh, you know the perception that other people had of you. Uh, Teba, what about you? How has uh, the stigma of mental health affected you personally? Could you imagine having a tattoo on your forehead <laughs> just out there? Yeah. I think that the these stigmas and misconceptions they make me feel like if I was to open up about my anxiety or depression that it's like I'm constantly walking around with this tattoo that labels me as depressed, anxious, like all the time. And um, you know, I felt like anxiety or depression would define me and inform how I navigate this world entirely. And that and negatively so and that isn't the case um and i think you know I, I only started going to therapy last year early last year um and you know and before then i've just been trying to unlearn what i've been conditioned to believe and um so yeah i think that's how those misconceptions have affected me it felt like having a like i would have a huge tattoo <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, and we have with us, everyone, two phenomenal, courageous women who have spoken out against something that they have faced a lot of their life. And we'll be uh, right back after the short break. Uh, you're watching Muslim Network TV. Thank you. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. Past campaigns covered a wide range of humanitarian concerns. Through Bosnia Task Force, Imams and leaders of Chicago's Muslim community worked to ensure Bosnia became a top national issue. This led to life-saving American policies in Bosnia. A key accomplishment was helping to get rape declared a war crime. Initiatives also included Kosovo Task Force, Central African Republic Task Force, and Flint Coalition, which brought awareness to the water crisis affecting the people of Flint, Michigan. Highlights of our work include supporting Black Lives Matter, Parliament of the World Religions, addressing climate change. So wasteful consumption starts the ruthless production, and that's where we need all the fossil fuel in the world. And prominent media exposure. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, uh, president of Justice for All. And I'm the director of outreach for Justice for All. And that's why we need to go back to what worked. Today we're demanding an apology uh, from the CEO of Costco. The Chinese crackdown on Uyghurs and other Turkic people has only gotten worse. Current programs such as Burma Task Force advocate for the rights of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, internally displaced populations, and all those denied freedom of movement and at risk of starvation. Through this, we mobilized thousands of calls to elected representatives. This paved the way for the U.S. to increase funding for Rohingya refugees from $30 million to over $600 million. Two of our documentaries were featured on international news outlets. The Rohingya People, a slow-burning genocide on BBC World News, and Rohingya Refugees Tell of Massacre was featured on CNN. We've organized rallies, 
UN mission visits, expanded presentations on campuses, promoted research and report writing, outreach to think tanks, media, and other influencers. Faith Coalition educates about the Rohingya genocide and crimes against humanity faced by ethnic groups in Burma. We've traveled to refugee camps, convened a meeting of Karen, Kachin, and Rohingya leaders, both to encourage cooperation and to guide them in congressional outreach. We organized Rohingya Advocacy Day. This led to over 100 participants visiting the offices of 60 U.S. Senators and congressional representatives. Free Kashmir advocates for the people of Kashmir. Long-term goals include the call for self-determination, the end of the Indian military's occupation of the territory, and raising awareness of Kashmiri issues among the American people. After the August 5th reinvasion of Kashmir, we organized national protests in front of various Indian government buildings, partnered with Stand with Kashmir, and launched a petition condemning the Gates Foundation's decision to present Prime Minister Modi a humanitarian award. Save Uyghur informs Muslims and neighbors of other faiths about the ongoing cultural genocide of Uyghur Muslims and mobilizes public support. Our projects include boycotting Chinese products with our Fast From China campaign, pushing Bill S-178 in the Senate, and organizing a nationwide protest of Costco. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. We're here on Galaxy 19 Satellite, MuslimNetwork.tv, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. Uh, we're here with Isha Barlas and Teba Duba, who have been speaking about the stigmas around mental health and how it has affected them personally. Now, I wanted to ask both of you, what are some effective methods of us, right? How can we as a community kind of go after these stigmas, kind of try to remove them from our society as a whole? Because from what you guys are saying, they seem to impact the lives of people who are undergoing mental health issues significantly. What is some effective methods uh, to kind of erase these stigmas? What are some steps we can take? Um, um, first of all, I think that there should be more dialogues like such as this one, mm. where people are able to ex share their individual experiences, their own thoughts, and like being able to maybe talk to someone who doesn't understand what mental issues are or how it's treated or what's, what causes it. And I feel like the more open we are about this dialogue and understanding and listening and talking to each other, um, I feel like that is the best way for our communities to unlearn these stigmas and actually understand and be more supportive is just by talking about it, especially in a way that is not degrading or where there's no um, judgment between the people and it's just honest conversation. Yeah, uh, I think that if we want to advocate for this cause, we have to tackle the environments and the institutions that inform us the most. So, for, for example, I'm thinking about um, children who are, for example, going to school, right? And it's like, what kind of what kind of events are you having at that school that may educate them about this? What kind of um, like what Isha was saying, what kind of panels, what kind of uh, classroom activities, you know, if if a child speaks out and maybe bullies another child for however they're feeling, um, you know, that those things should be immediately addressed. And you that's how we start creating, you know, that, that culture, that whole, you, know, you know, a better culture around that. Um, um, and, and, and that's just 
going to help uh, spark dialogue. And my question is, what about people who wish to speak out, but they're just afraid of the backlash from their community or their family? What is your advice to them? They want to speak about, out about what they're going through. They found the courage within themselves uh, to deal with this issue, but they're just afraid. Um, I feel like if they're just afraid because of, you know, the backlash they may receive from not only the community, but maybe their families or people that they are close with, um, I feel like maybe they should first try and come out anonymously, anonymously, mm -hmm. anonymously through maybe online forums and like get to know other people who have gone through similar things and maybe who are also scared of you know, the backlash they may receive from the, the people they know or the communities and maybe that would help them to figure out ways in which they could connect with those around them and be able to slowly be able to open up to those, to their families and their close ones and then maybe even make them strong enough to um, come out to the community as a whole and just be very open about it. So I feel like the best way is just to find other people that are in a similar situation and trying to support each other in building each other up to master the courage to be able to be open about it. Yeah. Um, Sarah, what about you? What advice do you have to people who are afraid to speak out? I think, um, like what Isha was saying, there are so many platforms right now uh, these days um, on the web. Um, that you can reach out to different communities that you can reach out to anonymously if, if, if that's best for you because you always have to be um, you know aware of your of your safety as well that's really, really important um, but then I also just want to say that if people who have been afraid and know that that stigma exists when they do come out about their own struggles that it is also important that they are patient with the people that they come out to because they've been they've been conditioned to believe whatever they believe. Nobody is, is just born uh, being, you know, unaccepted. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, nobody is just <laughs> born that way to discredit mental issues. Nobody's just born like it's learned. So it's, it's also important that you're patient with whoever you come out to. Yeah, and I, I want to ask what's your advice to allies, people who aren't necessarily relating to you, but they want to help, right? What are some mediums that they can help people with mental health issues through? Um, any of you, which one uh, you know, want to take that on? What are some uh, mediums that you know we can help, like allies can help people who are undergoing mental health issues? Isha and yeah. Kevin? There are a lot of like helplines, like through websites. There's um, obviously the UK and the American ones are different, but there's helplines, yeah. hotlines, suicide helplines, or um, there's so much online therapies. Or um, I'm sure in America as, as well, not only in the UK, that like, if you go to universities or schools, they have um, some sort of um, place that you could or a person that you can confide, confide in even if it's not directly about mental health just feeling down or anxious or a specific con um, situation that you are worried about there's someone or something in place for you to go to and mm -hmm. you know express that so I feel like there is a lot of help out there it's just about finding what works for you whether that's talking to someone over the phone or if that's online forums that you can post anonymous, anonymously to and just get general advice from, or reaching out to teachers or in the institutions, reaching out to specifically designed, you know, people or um, programs that deal with this type of, you know, feelings and individuals. Yeah, uh, Taba, would you like to add to that? Um. Just only, I think it's it's important for allies to avoid <clears throat> kind of like a, a savior complex. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I you know when I started opening up to to my parents and my brother and my sister, they were all like, 
from our word like we have to help you let's let's take it to therapy let's do this this and that and all coming from a sincere and very very good place and very healthy place um but that you know that that savior complex can be very harmful because what happens is if you're only focusing on saving this person and not just listening to them hearing what they want you to do what they need from you um then that can be just just as harmful um yeah so i think uh, as allied one of the things we should take away is just listen right be there for the other person don't try to push so many of your um, opinions and perspectives on them because i think what a lot of people need is just someone to listen to them and i want uh to hit on some of the work that both of you have been doing in order to advocate for mental health. I, you know, just from the beginning in your introduction, I know how heavily involved both of you are. Can you speak on some of the work that you do, maybe that can help um, motivate some other people that want to come out and advocate for mental health as well? Talk about um, your work a little. Okay, so um, I became an author and um, first of all, poetry and writing in general was always a coping mechanism for me through like my hard times back when I didn't talk about it and my mental issues with anyone and I kept it all to myself and I thought it was a way of me being able to express myself without telling anyone in particular. I was just kind of like putting my thoughts on a piece of paper that I can keep to myself. It was kind of like talking to someone like you know the relief you feel when you talk to someone it was kind of like having that same relief because it's like taking a little burden off your shoulder by just writing it out how you feel and I feel like that kind of validates how you feel as well because it becomes like a reality on a piece of paper and so for me I feel like everyone has some way of being able to express that themselves whether it's music whether it's art whether it's writing and for me because it was writing I decided that I could use this as a way of reaching out to other people by publishing a book specifically regarding mental health issues. So all the poetry that I've written in my book is specifically about self-harm, suicidal thoughts, and just all the aspects of depression and anxiety that anyone might feel. And it's kind of a way of people, when they read it, they, they, cause it's like I've been told by a lot of people that have already read it, that they can relate and it's something that you know that makes them feel like they've got someone else that understands exactly what they're going through and it kind of encourages them to speak out themselves and you know reach out so that was how I like personally um, used one of my hobbies I guess to turn it into something that could help other people reach out as well. Yeah, thank you um, for that. I think I, I spoke about this before, but once again, I want to say how much courage it, it probably took for you to do that. And we applaud you for that. You know, you made yourself vulnerable, put yourself out there so that you can help other people. Uh, Taba, what about you? Can you speak to us about some of the work that you've done in order to advocate for mental health? Yes, um, I am prim primarily concerned with what kind of environment are we creating? where we can have those spaces for people. Um, and the academy that I attended, we started a program called Mental Mondays, where every Monday we would meet and it would be a, a space where people can discuss openly and um, just open up and we would unlearn together. And we had you know, different resources that we would share with each other and um, you know, to help us unlearn those stigmas, the very stigmas that we're talking about right now, um, every Monday. And currently on campus, uh, I'm trying to work with the Health and Wellness Center so that we could get more representation, especially for the um, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, that community uh, on campus in the mental health department. Um, you know, especially in a time like this, where we're at a time of heightened trauma with everything that's on blast all over, all over the, the media, um, that is really necessary now. So if we can open spaces for those communities that are marginalized and that, like we're saying, don't have the same opportunities as others to just speak about their, their own mental challenges. Uh, wow. Mm -hmm. 
talk about how we're at a time of heightened, you know, trauma for all of us. There's so much going on in our world today. So before we end, I want to I wanna end on something that our uh, viewers can take away, you know. Uh, what can we do? What can they do? What, some, what are some tips that you have for people who are struggling with mental health issues just from your own personal experience? Um, first of all, I'd say that, you know, never feel that you are alone because this is something that many individuals go through throughout the world in all, part, in all communities. And whether that's, um, you know, in a community that is more accepting or whether it's not, it's something that you should never feel that you should be ashamed of or that it's something that you can control because as much as you feel like it's something you, can, you might be able to control by just you know, ignoring it or mm. pretending that, you know, you, you know, you don't have this issue and just trying to pretend everything's okay it can kind of make things worse for you. So I would definitely say to anyone that's going through any type of mental issues is first of all, don't be ashamed of it. And secondly, don't pretend that it's not there. Rather, address, try to address it and find a way that works for you to help yourself, you know. And I think that's very important that, you know, you don't, ignore it because of someone else's perception of what they think that you should do or shouldn't do. Yeah, um, Deborah, go ahead. I think, um, yeah, be patient with yourself and with the, the people who are around you. Um, that's really, that's very important for your own mental health too, is to be patient. Um, and there is no blueprint. There is no way that you are meant to be or, or or anything like that. Um, and then also, you know, strive to continue to unlearn um, whatever, whatever we've been conditioned with and, and those stigmas. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Isha and uh, Teba, for sharing your perspective today. We had a beautiful dialogue on an issue that is not spoken about enough. Thank you, both of you, for being on our show today. You're watching Muslim Network TV, and until tomorrow with a new episode, a new topic, and two new guests. Assalamu alaikum.